Hello, hello, uh-huh. my beautiful people. Welcome to Africanist Podcast, where we sprinkle love, joy, and African vibes all around. You know, like pepper in your jello fries. <laughs> I'm your host, Peace George, and I'm here to take you on an incredible journey through the heart and soul of Africa. Now, get ready to dance to the rhythm of our conversations and explore the vibrant tapestry of African culture because hey, this is where our kindness meets the motherland. Egbape. My name is Peace George, and I'm thrilled to welcome our distinguished guests who represent different regions of Africa as we delve into this exciting discussion. Remember the words of the Swahili proverb, Habana, Haba, Hujaza, Kebaba. Little by little, the pot gets filled. So please welcome my guests. My first guest here is from North Africa, Egypt. Shruk El Atta. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> alaikum salam. <laughs> so good to have you here in the studio. Thank you for joining us. No, it's right really now. good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. My second guest is Dr. Oli Afolayo. Ekabo. Sorry to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I did my own work. <laughs> Okay. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And my third guest is from Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, Mara Makoni. Hello, Mara. Mohoro. Oh. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you very much. I made you laugh. I, I'm sure I didn't get the pronunciation. Is that why you're laughing at me? No, not at all. Because I was, I was, I was waiting to see which greeting would then come, right? So, because you know, we've got, you know, we, we, it's we split between Debele and Shona, and Shona has various. There's Magadini, which is high, and there's Moro, which is high. So I was, I was waiting. To see. Oh, okay. So I chose the easier one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the easier yeah, one. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. All right. So my fourth guest is from. Eastern Africa, Uganda, and that is our dear darling Julie Kalungi. Hi, Julie. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Chikati. Did I get that right? Sorry? Chikati. 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 Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Am I far from it? It's a casual hi. Okay. Hi, yeah. hi. All right, then. I'm trying, I'm trying so hard to impress yeah. everyone. And we welcome, so well. welcome each and every one of you. Thank you so much for joining us. So to kick things off, um, let's start by introducing ourselves. I'm going to start with um, Mara, then Shrek, then Dr. Oli, and then Julie. You can take it away, Mara. Wow, uh, tough one. Um, <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> My name is uh, Mara Makoni. Uh, my so my full, full name is um, Mara Tafadzoa Makoni, and Tafadzoa is based. The clue is there that I'm, I'm Shona. Um, born in Zimbabwe, spent the first part of my 17 years there, and moved to England from when I was, you know, just about to turn. Um, just as I turned 17, actually. So I've been, you know, as I approach 40, so I'll leave the mathematicians to do their work there. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely honoured to to be here, particularly because, um, you know, some of these moments in um, reflecting on my own culture are just an immense, immense privilege to, and to do this in the comfort of friends and other cultures to just reflect on, you know, my heritage and something that I'm absolutely proud of being Shona and from um, part of the Shona tribe, the Makoni tribe, Maungwe tribe, where Makonis are from, um, in the Eastern Highlands of Zimbabwe. Wow, thank you so much. Good to have you here. All right, Shruk, hello. Hi. Um, so I am an electronics engineer by day, a belly dancer by night, and 24 yeah. 7 LGBT plus rights activist and refugee. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. I love your hair. So African. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Ollie. Hello. Hello. I'm uh, 
I'm not a belly dancer by night, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I'm a chemical engineer by background. I'm of uh, Yoruba, Yoruba heritage, uh, a, a man from uh, Ocean State in uh, Nigeria, uh, arrived in the world via London, but I am still uh, 100% Yoruba variety. <laughs> wow, well, thank you so much. Good to have you here. All right, finally, dear darling Julie, hello. Hi, I wish I was a belly dancer by night. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> you shall have a quiet moment, Shuru. Can you teach me how to do that? Yeah. That means Julie Sylvia Kalunji. I am a Muganda by tribe. I've been in the UK for coming to 23 years. Too long. <laughs> Too long. But um, I love it here. And I mm. consider myself British. Very much so. Uh, I'm the project lead for women and digital inclusion. Where we support the black migrant woman. We're very, mm. very specific about who we support. Because we don't want to be misled about who we support. We support mm. people uh, to get into the digital universe right here in Mezzi. Wow. And um, I, I, I'm excited just to be here. I am not by in, by any stretch of imagination a cultural expert, but I'd like to share what I know. All right. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. I love that. Thank you so much. Yes. And sure will be teaching all of us how to belly dance. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, don't <laughs> think, I don't think I'll be able to do it because, you know, all the Eba and the Pounder Yam, you, you can tell when you see my baby. So, yeah, how yeah. About? <laughs> yeah, I think some of us will need more help than others. We'll need more help I'm, than that, yeah. I, I'm thinking of myself here. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to lift myself from the floor I'm set. <laughs> no, I don't think it's my belly that will be dancing. My belly will be doing the dance. I tell you. We'll help each other, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are not giving yourselves enough credit. I tried, um, I tried to teach people from around the world, uh, and definitely Africans have it. Wait, which country won? Not. Which, which, country, which country won? Which country won? Ooh, uh, now you get the African competition. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on from this to Jalof. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much, everyone. I love it. It's exciting here in the house. This is Africa, my people. Mm. Africa, this is it. You know, north, south, east and west. And I love it. I'm thrilled to welcome uh, my distinguished guests here. Um, they represent different regions of Africa. I don't think we always have this kind of thing. So, you know, I'm so proud of us. Thank you so much. Right, so we're going to delve into this exciting discussion, right? Um, and today <laughs> we will be talking about our cultural heritage mm -hmm. and identity. So to kind of bring together the first episode and this one, uh, we talked about the Africa Day in our last on our last episode and you know none of us knew what that was before we came here into the studio but we managed to kind of get, get things done but i remember dr Oli, you're here again because you mentioned um the african identity and i just thought you know it would be a great place to start so yes our first stop on this cultural voyage is to understand this profound link between our cultural heritage and our, our identity. This Ghanaian poet, Kofi Awuno, once wrote, I am the heritage of a thousand generations. And I love that. But I want us to, you know, have a discussion around that. Our heritage deeply rooted in our traditions, shaping our identities and connecting us to a lining that stretches back through time. So I'm going to start with Dr. Oli, and we're going to talk about how our cultural heritage links with our identity. Take it away, Doctor. It's a it's amazing and, and a really profound question. Uh, we have these building blocks that make who we are, um, everything from uh, our, our heritage, our achievements, um, our, 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 our abilities and other people's opinions. And uh, that in the middle of that is this idea that you and I come from um, a tradition of a set of stories that have been told over 
a long period of time. And sometimes I struggle with the issue of the African identity because Africa is not a monolith. It's one of the most diverse and varied continents that exists. And even the whole idea of being called Africa is itself uh, uh, has a lot a lot of a very interesting history w- with it. But the thing that I link, I connect with the most, uh, and when I think of particularly uh, the Yoruba culture, is is this idea of stories, mm. and it, it is is this idea of stories that pass on. Uh, the, the African ideal, the African values, and you know, when I was younger, we used to be told about the uh, the story of the of the tortoise, who was uh, w- uh, the, the 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 tortoise that was w- weak uh, in some ways, but very very smart, and always found a way to work out what the right way was to do in any situation and i think that also conveyed some really powerful values so when when i when i when i think of what it means to be african and uh what it means i think of i am a product i am a result of all of the stories and all of the narratives that have been shared about what it means and then linked to that of course is this idea that other people's opinions sometimes have often got in the way and affected and influenced that pride and that sense of ownership. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You know, I can relate with the Tottie story. I grew up with that one. So, yeah, anything where, you know, Tottie's slow and steady. They taught us how to be slow and steady with the Tottie's. Thank you so much for that summation. Right, I'm going to go straight to Shrook. Hello. Hello. Hi there. So, yes, what do you think? The African um, heritage and our identity, how are they linked? Uh, There's so much really that I have to say and thank Egypt for, um, which is part of the continent. And I agree with um, Oli on, you know, Africa is not a homogenous place, but it's still a community. Um, And I feel like Egypt could do a lot more of that. I feel like Egypt um, can uh, sort of have more of that community feel with the rest of the continent. I I don't think that we do that very well and there's a lot of room for improvement, but it's also, uh, and I, I think, I think actually guys, like, let me know if you come from a similar background, but as an engineer and a woman, it is not uncommon uh, for people like me to, to be engineers in Egypt, for women to be engineers in Egypt, it's about a 50-50% split. Wow. But we have all of these like ideas about, oh, we need to learn from the West or uh, the West is so much more progressive. But, you know, in the UK, um, w- women engineers are right now, I think, 12 percent. And when I started my career in 2013, we were 8 percent. So we're growing at a very, 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 very small rate. Um, and I think there's so much for us in the West, so much for countries like the UK to learn from Africa. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for that submission. I love it. Right, Mara, I've got a question for you, just to build up on what <laughs> Sherwood and I'm sorry, go on. Dr. Oli, excuse you, and Dr. Oli has said, just to kind of build up on that, he talked about other things. These are the things that take these things away from us. What do you think about that? What are these things that can, you know, take away from our uh, our identity? There are so many things we, you know, like he said, the language, the proverbs, which is why, you know, I'm going to be speaking to you all about proverbs a lot today, (laughs) okay, because, you know, it's part of our culture, right? But I would love to know what are those things that you believe has taken away from our cultural, taking our cultural heritage away from us. We all know where we come from, but subtly, like he rightly said, Dr. Oli said, there are things that have taken these things from us. What do you think these things are? Um, <clears throat> interesting. I'd, firstly, I'd, I'd, just, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge <laughs> when Oli started speaking, I was like, wait, that was that was my script. <laughs> 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 I was like, that was the line that I had prepared. 
was in my head, bro. Brad tried to say, I am. A oh my god. Great story that was told from the great migration of the Bantu from the eastern parts of Africa straight through to Zimbabwe. And I was, mm-hmm. but anyway, I suppose what just to acknowledge what that does is, you know, we talked about Africa not being homo- homogenous, right? But at the center of all of this, there's a lot of that identity where the strong connection to identity, the strong sense of even within our different tribes, we're still able to relate to the same thing, like, you know, the tortoise. It's it's so amazing. That's what I grew up on as well. Like you know, the stories that you sit around the fire. Why the what you know why the leopard had spots. Why. So um, just as a shout out, actually, BBC had these Tinga Tinga stories. That yeah. were English story translation of all, and I actually sat through them, and I remember thinking, remembering every moment that story was told to me, and where I was. Mm-hmm. as a child and the the actually understanding why the tortoise's shell was cracked why yes. <laughs> why chameleon changed color oh. why the mingo stand with one leg like it just is but anyway back to your question <laughs> um <laughs> i think some of the things just coming back to that in the richness of the story that um one of the things that i certainly feel like if i was to have children um here is thinking about how I grew up and how I understood term time, how I understood holidays. Holidays was the time that you went to be reared by grandparents, right? So you went and we went to the village. You understood how to work in the field. You understood how to relate to culture where your grandmother, your grandmother was often the greatest storyteller. And you'd sit in your grandmother's, around your grandmother, eating specific, you know, corn nuts, mm-hmm. you know, roasted corn nuts straight off the fire with nuts. And you'd sit there and that was like the, the great snack. And it was also a sneaky way of prolonging your, your, uh, your bedtime. So to me, things like that is like, you know, you relate to that as your identity. Because right now, when I look at my relationship with my grandmother, um, I think of it as she was my, almost my deputy mother, my secondary mother. Mm. same way my grandfather was and thinking about because of now living right, living in England it, grandmother might be somebody who you go to visit mm. once a year whereas you knew every two weeks after every term that was a way of life it was an actual and part of that heritage that identity via my be- storytelling everything I do in life is about telling a story and I always say it's the greatest expression of your, your history, your culture, and even sometimes talking through some of the lowest points, I wouldn't call them failures in life. So I think that's something that I certainly feel having that disconnect with mm. my home and accessibility to my culture in terms of just even my own family and certain, just even certain traditions, right? So things like um, our traditional marriages, you know, there were certain ways, like, you know, cows were exchanged. Now now people just, I think they exchanged sword codes. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if people <laughs> arrived at these bridal ceremonies and swipe cards. But, you know, mm-hmm. things like that. There was, there was meaning in saying, well, there's a reason you give the female cow or there's a reason in our tradition there's the, you know, the blanket for the mother to sign- symbolizes this and all of that. So I think some of the things that I definitely, I feel, have, have sort of, I wouldn't say they've been taken away. I'd suppose just that um, geography has sort of disconnected for me a bit. It's great for me because I can always tell the story and experience it. But perhaps this is where I have to have a conscious way of thinking. You know, when I look at nieces, nephews, children in the next generation, where will they lose that? And how is it that we can keep that going on and bring some elements of that and instill that in them? I don't know if that answers the question. It does. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I love that. All right. Thank you. Yes, Julie, um, you know, there was something that Shurik said and um, it hit a nerve, actually. Thank you, Shurik. She mentioned that um, there were some things you wouldn't be able to do as a female back, yeah. back in Africa. And, and she's right. Mm-hmm. And I think those things, we still have them until they, but let's talk about how things have now changed and what do you think changed it because i've heard people say oh you know they've taken this from us this they've taken that from us but you know looking on the bright side of things what are the things that civilization has saved us from as a continent 
Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> no, because you know, I just have I because I'm trying to get things from all of you because yes. I believe that we have a flow, and you know, this this discussion is going to be rich. It's Let's a beautiful go. question, you see. Yeah, because yeah. I've just had the privilege of having uh, 14 women sit together over the last six months and put together an oral history record of the wow. different cultures from different parts of Africa. And we went right across to the Caribbean as well because they're also black and they have a bit of Africa in them, well, a lot of Africa in them. And uh, so we created an oral history record that's now available in the uh, UK records office uh, archived in the Liverpool Central Library. And we went a step further. We said, well, how many people go to the Liverpool Central Library? So we created a book, that mm -hmm. one. Wow, looks beautiful. Let's check. Love it. Now, that book would have been that big if I'd allowed the women to go to share everything they wanted to share. They really had a lot to share. But I'll just bring you back to your question. You see, I never imagined growing up as a young girl in Uganda that I would ever leave my country, let alone the place I was born in. Mm. You know, let alone be here in Liverpool, in the land of my empire speaking a language other than my mother tongue in a city where i have faced racial differences capitalism institutionalized racism misogyny and all the intersectionalities that a black woman in the system of oppression faces that have formed me and made me who i am today hmm. and have given me opportunities to grow and to support my my um, communities to grow as well what we are missing here is uh, traditions change. Traditions change with generations. We are right now in the middle of a digital revolution, which is wiping out the industrial revolution. But we are still stuck in an industrial revolution. Mm. And as black people, Africans, we have been mentally enslaved. See, we are speaking a language other than our own mother tongues because mm. we have so many mother tongues from africa like for instance uh Oli, correct me if i'm wrong nigeria has over 700 languages correct yeah. about about 800 yeah yeah uh, okay. right. connect as africa and come together with one purpose if we can't even speak the same language see mm. that's what uh, United Kingdom has. They have one language that connects them, even though they are the Scottish, the Welsh, the Hackneys, the who, they, they, they are several different people. But they all can speak the one language. And they have convinced the world that it's the best language ever. <laughs> so the whole world endeavors to speak English. Mm. And so imagine the richness of the stories we would have access to if there was a variety in the internet language. Because hmm. we don't Google in English. I don't know anyone who Googles in any other language. You can Google Translate, but you have to Google in English. Hmm. So the cultures we would learn about, what would happen if we started listening and learning from those different cultures to form one culture as Africans, as Black people, that we can put bring to the table and be able to actually talk about things that concern us here in the diaspora. Hmm. Because our differences are played on. And then we are taken back to the slave mentality. Uh, where I grew up, <clears throat> when speak English in school, you were punished. Hmm. It was so vernacular. Not your language, not hmm. proud of your mother tongue, but you're speaking vernacular and you should not do that. And so when I grew up, I did not have that kind of motivation to teach my, my children my mother tongue. It was almost like a mental block. And then when I started teaching it to them, <laughs> it was a challenge because mm. they would challenge me. Why should I learn that language? I live here. I was mm. born here. And no amount of convincing get them to see that it's a language they should learn and, and be proud of now they are trying to learn it mm. but it would be much easier to learn if they were younger so personally i believe the change is essential traditions change and it is our duty 
to pick up what's great in our traditions and bring it to our societies today. I don't know about you, but I don't think there's anything called English food. There's no English jollof. Exactly. <laughs> so we can bring the richness of our country to this country and just if we could agree on something, <laughs> starting with a language. I don't, know I, I don't necessarily agree because I, I don't like the I know the world speaks English but mm-hmm. because they were forced to speak English because people yeah. were enslaved because people were colonized Egypt is an ex-colony and I'm sure many of the countries represented here today were an ex-colony too mm-hmm. um, and actually I was saying the things that I can do in Egypt and can't do here. So it's much easier to be an engineer and a woman in Egypt or much easier to have those ambitions than if you're a woman in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. Can I... So yes, just, go, go just before I forget, um, just going back to, to Julie, uh, I'm coming, coming back to um, that part of the, her part of the world, the Eastern part, mm-hmm. I, I, I always want to acknowledge one of the greatest things that our culture and heritage has given to the world in innovation, and that is mm-hmm. the, the M-Pesa digital banking. And the reason mm-hmm. why this is very important yes. is because this was born out of our culture where you grow up in a village and you have every ounce of responsibility to look after those that you leave behind. Mm-hmm. The ethos that the, those, the little you have is going to support the many that come for, you know, when they talk about it takes a village to raise a child, the very mm-hmm. ethos around that is what allowed that innovation to take place. So this was born out of effectively, you know, people who went into town and were relying on buses. So, you know, somebody would send a letter via bus bus conductor back to the village to say, mom, I'm going to send you money. Do you mind coming to the bus stop next week? Mom sends a you know, a letter back by the conductor to say thank you, Mara. I'll send. I will be waiting on the bus stop at Wednesday, on Wednesday, and then on Wednesday you get up, you go to the bus stop, and then you deliver the money. You know, that entire thing was solved by Africans who were working for Safaricom at the time, and they understood mm-hmm. that obligation. Mm-hmm. Because I think if it had been just solely a Western company, they would have built banks <laughs> all around Africa. But it was literally just thinking, well, in the simplest sense. The one thing that the the few with the the, the the few with the much are supposed to give back to those that raised them, the village, whether it's your uncle, whether it's your own mother who sometimes had to look after a grandmother looking after mm-hmm. uh, siblings, and especially countries where things like um, AIDS are rife, where you then had a generation that had been taken out, you have a grandmother looking after grandkids. So I always say, so even then you look and look at the, the greatness of our heritage and how that delivered and the greatest pieces of innovation in the digital world. And I'm forever mm-hmm. talking about the story and talking about the importance of letting sometimes things just happen organically, but mm-hmm. also being grateful for the fabric of our, you know, our identity. Mm. And being true to identity that, listen, at the end of it. And it's the reason why, for example, one of the biggest inflows of money above international aid is remittances, right? From mm-hmm. diaspora. That's true. Because we all out here, the first thing I think about is mm. what happens back home. So I always say that that's that's coming back to, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, yes, we've had to move along with times, but sometimes sticking to our ways has paid off. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. The, the depth of this discussion, I don't know. I, I don't think we would have enough time, but thank I, you so I much. I think what we brought to the UK, all of us, and I think what you've been raised with, Oli, is risk. Mm-hmm. It's the one thing I've learned across the 14 <laughs> women sharing their stories. If we, if we are raised with so much respect mm-hmm. for authority, for systems, for people we consider of a certain stature, but sometimes it's also the same okay. respect that kind kind of holds our mouth when we should speak up, uh, right. uh, stay quiet when we should raise our hand and say enough is enough. Exactly. And so where do respect, where do we say respect starts here, but we've got to, to speak up for ourselves here. Or we need to get rid of leaders sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> not that. pointing, not pointing. You know. Wow. <laughs> we don't have anyone from Ghana here because they have <laughs> not uh, pointing anywhere. <laughs> it's a tradition. Can you imagine if children are told, 
respect and stay quiet before complaining mm. you need mm. to speak up because a lot of times when we say things that are hard it's called complaining mm. It, it's, 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 it's quite interesting what you say because we, we have been exploring, for example, at um, AFBE, why we don't get the level of representation mm. at leadership level within the engineering sector. And we've been trying to explore it. And one thing that's occurred to me is that quite a number of the limiting behaviours mm. uh, that uh, a lot of our people, if you like, um, have are the things that hold us back are also the things that are very positive, the very positive things that you have just been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and certainly that idea of being able to, uh, to really understand who we are and understand uh, the sort of different facets of who we are and, you know, how that can be a double-edged sword is, is actually quite a, is a very important aspect of... Um, you know, of, of embracing, uh, embracing African culture. Um, that that thing we've been saying so far around uh, the stories that we we tell ourselves uh, about ourselves is so important. Um, there's also this aspect of you know, uh, very well embodied in Chimamanda Adichie's uh, yeah. "The Danger of a Single Story," yeah. and I, I don't think that the world has really, really come to appreciate and, uh, and uh, has come to really hear the African story. And by that, I mean the fullness of our contribution. Bit, bit like exactly what Shrook said at the start, which is, uh, you know, um, there are so many positive stories to tell, but there are so many things that the world depends on. And Mara embodied that in that in that example that you, that, that, that you just shared, um, which just doesn't get heard enough. And I guess one of the ways in which we can truly embrace culture and truly embrace our culture and truly be uh, ambassador of our culture is to tell that story. Uh, mm -hmm. A friend of mine recently was in Los Angeles and, and uh, you know, the, the famous Hall of, uh, you know, the, what would you call it, Hollywood Walk of Fame. Mm -hmm. And he had the same feeling that most people get when they, when they get there. It's like, is this it? This is what everyone's been talking about. But we all think it's so much more glamorous than it is because then nobody hypes up America more mm. than Americans. Mm. And I think there That's is true. a certain degree of that um, storytelling that we must start to do a lot more of and we must start to search for. I absolutely agree with you, Dr. Ali. Yeah. I mean, our stories that are out there, we're not the ones telling them. Yeah, we're not the ones telling them, so we, we don't even know what's out there, to be honest. Thank you so much for your contributions. I love them. Keep them coming. All right. So <laughs> this question is for you, Shrook. Uh, you know, I because I love your hair because I love your hair. So we need to talk about the girl. We need to talk about this. Okay. So talking about your identity, I saw that right away. Okay, and for the sake of the you know the young people who will be listening to this, I want us to talk about, for instance, your hair. I know that you know uh, there was this thing. I even I had it as an adult. Uh, I would say the texture of my hair is not good enough, mm. and so I had this Brazilian hair. Mm. I had all sorts of wigs, and you know my my <laughs> my edges were suffering and screaming. Yeah crying you mm. know and you would go to the market you had relaxers we, we really didn't have anything yeah. to put our hair with and here you are i'm looking at you you look so so beautiful with that hair and this is mara with her headgear you know so african this is julie super <laughs> proud of you that's all in your here i feel i feel left out i feel oh. left out <laughs> julie, julie you need to give me that headpiece <laughs> yeah, so, but it's it's super amazing because just looking at just looking staring at the screen here i'm seeing africa so i want you um sure to speak to the young ones out there in you that know, talking about the level the, the standard of beauty how does it take away from subtly take away from our africanness we, we like to use that word here mm -hmm. how does it take away from our africanness yeah but, you, but what's really upsetting is every time i have a video call with my mom or my family the first thing they tell me is when are you going to straighten your hair <laughs> And, you know, literally just like, do you like this hair straighteners? Can we send this one to your house? 
and um, mm. I was actually kicked out of school in Egypt when I was like in grade three or something. I was a child because I went into my hair, not, uh, not went into school, um, not in a ponytail and not straightened. And the principal took me out of the class and was like, this is not a professional look. And I was like, but friend who was my friend also didn't have her hair in a ponytail. And he literally told me that's because her hair is straight. So I was straightening my hair. I was skin bleaching my face since I was like 11. And it took such a long time to sort of be comfortable again with, you know, what I'm born with. And, and I'm not against people straightening their hair if they want to. I'm not against people crimping their hair if they want to, but it's it's just the, what you're forced into. And it, it just saddens me that it's it's us. It's us who hates us. Mm, that's yeah. deep. True. Wow, that's very deep. It's us who hates us. Mm. Mm. You know, when I saw your confidence wearing that hair, I knew. We always have a story. There's always a story behind every identity that you see. Like, I'm making a statement whether you like it or not. And I love it. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. Dr. Ollie, take it away. I was just going to, I mean, uh, that's so inspiring, uh, what, what you just said, and so powerful. And it's just this, this idea of... You know, we, we, we talk about and, you know, we talked about this in the first first session uh, piece. Um, we talked about we talk about systemic racism, we talk about institutional, we talk about interpersonal. The real issue, the, the thing that's there when the perpetrator is gone, but self-perpetuates, is the self-loathing and internalized racism. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, is something that has been conditioned. And the only real answer to that, the only real answer to, antidote is to tell a different story. You know, mm. that great example from Greek mythology where a person, in order not to destroy himself, a, a man called Odysseus, in order not to destroy himself because of the, the sound of the, the sirens, decides to tie himself to a mast. Uh, and then another person, Ophias, decides, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to listen to another tune. I'm going to get this other person who will play a wonderful tune and that will take me away from having to destroy myself. And I think... It is a similar analogy when we think about African culture. We need to continue to help perpetuate a different story. Uh, more people will have seen Shriek and that will tell them that it's okay for me to, to wear my hair the way I do. It's okay for me to embrace my identity the way I do. And I think that is the antidote to the biggest problem that we have to the African story is this idea that it's not good enough. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much. You know, I've, I've really been touched by what Shuruka said and what Oli is saying because it, it goes right back down to that slave mentality. We have been enslaved mentally, even though we are free. Because um, most of us black women have straightened our hair at some point, most of us, of a certain age. I love that the young people are saying, I love my hair. I used to straighten my daughter's hair when she was a child. When she turned 12, she said, no, mommy, I don't, I don't want straight hair. I like my hair. I'm like, where did you get that? She said, my granny said, I'm more beautiful with my hair. There you go. <laughs> Hallelujah, <laughs> granny. Thank you for this because it was killing me. Um, mm -hmm. And she has not had a single chemical in her head since 12. But her friends mm. kept telling her, you looked more beautiful with straight hair. Mm. You looked more beautiful with straight hair. So she came home very, very upset one day from school and said, mommy, my friends say I'm more beautiful with straight hair, but my granny said I'm beautiful with my hair. Which one is true? I said, your granny is, true. is right, of course, because your hair is your natural hair. Straight hair is for them, those friends of yours, were born with straight hair you're not like them you're a different person you see those flowers outside are they all the same they're different variety in humanity variety in nature you are beautiful they are beautiful don't mind them you're all beautiful so she went and told them that the next day in school she was given uh, told what do they call it when they tell you to stay behind in school Detention. 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 That she was wow. disrupting. Yeah. She was disrupting uh, 
in class telling people things that were racist. Oh, wow. It's called racist. <laughs> and I was so shocked. I had to educate the teacher on African people here. Fortunately, by that time, I'd followed my daughter so that I would inspire her. I was so mm. natural. So mm. I told her, this is my hair. Mm. Mm. That's my daughter. She has mm. similar hair. So she's educating her friends about the differences in humanity. How racist mm. is that? Mm. Mm. And the teacher was like, and uh, uh, I said, no, is that racist? Because if it is, I would need to be educated about it. Sure. And I'd love that to be taken off my daughter's record. Yeah. Yeah. Because if she wants to go to, God forbid, o- Oxford, Cambridge or whatever, <laughs> that's on a record. So take mm. it off now. Mm. Oh, wow. And, um, I, so I, I, we I, have to educate people about mm. our Africanness. It's beautiful. Yeah. We have been told to embrace straightened hair, uh, straightened weaves. You're gorgeous with a weave. Yeah, I'm gorgeous with my hair. And I can put on a headdress because that's very African. Yeah. I don't know if it's <laughs> at all. When it's not in a headdress, it's in plates. Mm. And that's it because it's beautiful. And the more we educate our young people that they're beautiful the way they are, um, I, you know, the better for them because uh, Shuruk has gone through colorism mm. yeah that's what it is and uh, that's another thing I know young people who I know what color they were when they were younger in mm. our community and now they look like they're, they're you know half white children mm. and I'm thinking why would your parent let you go there but you're not their parent and you cannot stop them unless you have really quality time with them. And so starting the conversation would, would be bringing all kinds of challenges between you and the other community members. But it's something we need to speak about as African people. Mm-hmm. Colorism, racism, all those challenges that come with being black, African, and a whole variety of Africanness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been super amazing here in the studio, just listening to each and every one of you, you know, talking about beauty. I'm reminded of some African proverbs. One of them says the beauty of a gazelle is in its swiftness, not in its resemblance to a hearse. (laughs) Another one says a lion does not concern itself with the opinion of sheep. Eh? So your look is perfect. You are great and blessed with all that you have. Thick hair or not, you're beautiful. A Southern African proverb says, you cannot enhance the beauty of a flower by comparing it to other flowers. So stop the comparison. Appreciate what you have. Love your skin. Love your thick hair. And be proud of our heritage. Ah, ah. Be proud of our heritage. And you know, because of our time, we are going to have to round up. But you can join us on our second series because this matter continues. Check it. <laughs> oh, yes. Listen, there's a dynamic interplay between cultural diversity and the African identity. And we have explored some of it, but there is more. There is more because Africa is a tapestry of diverse cultures, languages, and traditions, each contributing to the vibrant mosaic that is our collective African identity. So join us next week on the Series 2 of this episode. It's going to be super, super amazing. And I just want to take the time to say thank you to my guests, Shuruk from Egypt. Thank you so much. Dr. Oli Afalaya from Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And I also have Julie from, (laughs) yes, Julie is from Uganda. And I have Mara from Zimbabwe has been absolutely wonderful traveling the streets of Lagos 
and straight to the land of the pharaohs, you know, the majestic plains of Zimbabwe and the vibrant hills of Uganda. Just listening to all of you, this is Africa. See you again next week. I love you all. Take care of yourself. Stay kind, stay curious, and stay proud of Africa. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Africanness, where we celebrate African culture and tell our stories. We hope you've learned something new and gained a deeper appreciation for the continent. <laughs> Join us next time for more conversation, more stories, and more kindness. And remember, our past, present, and future are interconnected, and it's up to us. Awala Matushe, it's up to us to shape the narrative and create a better world for our children. Until next time, Ewa Badu, stay kind, stay curious, stay cool, and of course, stay proud of your roots. Awala Ni Africa.